1962, I was crowned the Queen of Soul. Uh, with respect to maintaining my title as the Queen of Soul, I th it, well, it's second nature to me. And I think just being myself, uh, the rest will take care of itself. Show me the way to get the soul real, baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's soul. It's exactly soul. That's what it is. She's uh, the queen of soul. And uh, if if I can, I can't even describe it. All I can tell you is I can feel it. You know, it's just that deep. It's just right from there. Yeah. Her voice is one of the great natural instruments I've ever heard, and the way she uses it is just so instinctive and so beautiful. She knows exactly what she wants. <laughs> She was like five years old. I mean, she could go to the piano and play nearly like she plays it now. None of the rest of us could do that. You know, none of the rest of us could just go sit down and play the piano and, uh, and sing like that. And... raised in the church and so was I. I mean, <laughs> so I mean, you know, uh, uh, I guess your music, I mean, what's in your body, I mean, what's in your soul or the way you came up is, is somehow or another will come out through your fingers or come out through your, your vocal cords or whatever. The church, certainly uh, gospel, are my roots, and um, it certainly served as a testing ground for me as a singer as well, as many other good things came from the church. Uh, and it's just a feeling that you get there that you don't get anywhere else. in um, the choir at my father's church, the Bethel Baptist Church. Um, my father is a minister, and from the choir I became a soloist along with the choir. And uh, I left the church at times to travel with my father, Reverend C.L. Franklin. In the 1950s and 60s, Reverend Franklin was a mighty figure in black America. He was a powerful member of the National Baptist Church, a group whose seven million members made it the largest black organization outside of Africa. But Reverend Franklin was more than a religious leader. He was one of the first ministers to have his sermons released on records and to host his own nationally broadcast radio show, through which he reached millions. And you know, whatever your mental attitude is, has a lot to do with what you're going to be and how successful you are in your efforts. Remember, in black society, the minister is bigger than the president. If I'm in New York 
and my sister died in Mississippi, okay, I have no place I can eat as I go down. I have no place I can sleep. So it was the Baptist minister here that would call Baptist ministers on the way down. And so that black Baptist church had a fantastic role in saving me from being dehumanized. Aretha, born March 25, 1942, was the third of four children. Her mother Louise left the family when Aretha was only six and died when she was 10. Left to raise the family by himself, Reverend Franklin emerged as a constant source of strength and inspiration in Aretha's life. He was a very liberal minister, which kept us in trouble because he knew all the performers in both realms, you know, pop, blues, gospel. And then during that time, during the 50s and all, that was unusual for a minister to have that kind of association outside of the church. Because of Reverend Franklin's fame, stars from all branches of American music gravitated to his home. Sam Cooke, Clara Ward, and Jackie Wilson were just a few of the musicians who filled the Franklin house with their presence and their music. Every time I think about uh, my early childhood, it would be waking up to the sound of uh, a stand-up bass or uh, someone's guitar or, or the piano, and that might be the Oscar Peterson Trio, or that might be the Art Tatum group. We would drag her out of bed, and she'd go down there and <coughs> play for the stars. And they, you know, considered her a star once they heard her. I think that my dad felt that I was gifted or uniquely talented as a child, yes. Uh, he would coach me in different things. He would give me different records to listen to and to see if I could emulate them on the piano, uh, different vocalists to listen to, such as Clara Ward and uh, Mahalia, other artists like that. services across the country. I would travel with my dad. I was about 14, 15. On the weekends, I could go. And he would give me $50 each time. I would sing uh, one or two songs. And it was quite exciting. I not only saw and heard and performed with the gospel greats, but I also saw other artists uh, that were in the pop field that I liked and whose, whose records I bought as a child and as a teenager. People like Fats Domino and Bobby Bland and many other artists that would be staying in the same hotel and that we would be staying in. And so I had the opportunity to meet them as well. Aretha, in most instances, uh, would seen just before her father, Reverend Franklin, naturally being a minister, was the headliner most times. And uh, then Aretha would do a solo just before uh, the Reverend would do his uh, sermon. I gained a lot of experience on the road with him. And then um, I decided I wanted to change fields. So I let him know. And uh, he felt that this was what I wanted to do, and this is what I should do. If you
I think there was some some conflict in the church congregation right. mm -hmm. concerning her crossing over. They felt to some degree that uh, she was turning her back on either the church or on God by singing secular music. However, my father played uh, quite an instrumental role in, in elevating the people's enlightenment. Aretha was a restless young woman who'd had two children by the time she was 17 and had gotten married in her early 20s. Just as Aretha was maturing into womanhood, she sought new challenges as an artist. Over the objections of some churchgoers, Reverend Franklin arranged for her to record demo tapes of pop and jazz material in hopes of landing a recording contract. We both liked Columbia. Columbia was a major and uh, well-known label at the time. And so we went to New York. I began to live in the Big Apple. My first encounter with Aretha was listening on, on demo, uh, to a demo record. But I heard this voice and I said, my God, that's the greatest voice I've heard since Billy Holiday. <laughs> And I signed it to Columbia, even though uh, Sam Cooke was trying desperately to get it for RCA. And I, I made, I think, some very good records with Aretha at Columbia. And uh, we, I wanted to keep us to a degree as a jazz singer. Uh, and, and, but Columbia wanted to make a big pop star out of her which I thought would ruin her integrity. When you went and left me there crying Your goodbye was even colder than ice It didn't bother you, I was crying And now you want to break my heart twice Is that why you got in touch with me? While everybody around her met well, I think that those, those who probably met more than well are the ones who were the distractors. I, I, I think that um, I used to argue with her husband, Ted White. Not in front of her, but behind her back, I would argue with him, why can't you let her do what she wants to do? And uh, the moment she was able to do it, uh, the rest, I mean, you know, she be really became an international star at that, at that point in time. Aretha had terrible luck with men. That was, that was one of the awful parts of it. And there'd be one, quote, husband after another handling her affairs, you know, and uh, it was a mess. And uh, also, uh, they weren't picking the right material for her. Columbia was basically a white company. Everyone had a different 
idea and concept of how and what she should be doing. While they all knew that she was a great talent, nobody had the real concept of what to do with her. I was having what was called turntable hits. Turntable hits are records that get a lot of play, but they did not garner a lot of sales. We wanted hits. Everyone else was having hits, and I didn't have a hit record. And uh, Jerry Wexler had extended uh, the offer of a contract, and that is when I signed with, with Atlantic Records in 1967. Well, she knew everything about music. She didn't know everything about recording, but she sure knew everything about music. Well, Aretha was a, a legendary recording artist making excellent records, but just not in the mainstream of public acceptance level. And we were all astutely aware of what her facility was. Uh, and you kind of stood in awe of what she was doing but there was no one-on-one -on -one contact with the personality or with the individual. And uh, the first recording sessions that were planned for Atlantic Records were going to be in the South, uh, in an area just outside of Memphis, Tennessee, called Muscle Shoals, Alabama. It was coming from this lady. I mean, it was just unreal. I mean, I, w I was the drummer on the session and as soon as she started playing I thought oh this is not going to be any trouble at all this is going to be great she's really got something and the first time I saw her was the day she walked in the studio that we were going to make the first record uh, and uh, when she sat down at the piano it was like oh <laughs> something serious is going to happen it was very very obvious that something was going to happen everybody just stopped in their tracks and then it was why, like, the night on Bald Mountain, while Purgus knocked, everything went crazy. Everything went flying to pieces. Fights and screaming and then back to the motel and footsteps up and down the hall and doors slamming and maybe there were shots being fired, I don't know. <laughs> there were some frictions between some of the people who were there with Aretha and some of the players. So Aretha got out of town that morning. So when I got back to New York, I was terribly excited about it. I never loved a man. So the distributors heard about it and they said, okay, we're ready for a record. We didn't have a record because we had one side of a record. And uh, I couldn't find Aretha. Well, ultimately, I located her. And we finished this record and uh, to me it was just a fabulous piece of improvisation of finishing this record put together with spit, chewing gum, and bailing wire. big record there was I Never Loved a Man. That was my first million-selling record. I never loved a man the way I love you. We didn't make her a star. She was always a star. She'll forever be a star. We just got her into a popular acceptance level in one slot. Ladies and gentlemen, let us meet Miss Aretha Franklin. At Atlantic, Aretha made more than a commercial breakthrough. Aretha found her style, blending her gospel vocals and inventive piano playing with secular love songs. Aretha defined soul music as an expression of the 60s Black Pride movement and her own inner feelings. From 1967 into the mid-1970s, it was a rare Aretha recording that was not a soul classic. When Aretha came on the scene, as far as how I would rank her, 
I would certainly ha have to, to put, uh, put her among uh, the, the creators, you know, people who genuinely uh, to, uh, create the, the sound that other people wish they could do. Aretha continued what Ray Charles started, which is the secularization of gospel music, of taking gospel melodies, gospel emotion, gospel rhythms, and putting the devil's words to them. One of the reasons for some of the hits at, at Atlantic was my gospel background being merged with the popular or R&B styling. So I think that certainly, along with company promotion, et cetera, had something to do with the records being successful. I take great pleasure in presenting to you the Cashbox Achievement Award for 1967. You finished first in singles, first on albums, and first in rhythm and blues. Aretha also won all the awards available to a female vocalist in record world magazine. Aretha was viewed as more than an entertainer. She stood as a potent symbol of black advancement. Her voice was one tangible example of black power. And in her own way, Aretha touched America as profoundly as any civil rights leader. You got young people now that could tell you more about Aretha than they could tell you about the civil rights movement. I can hear Aretha in the 60s. I'm not saying you can't hear her now, but then I could hear three or four times an hour. Well, I never heard King except on the news. Dr. King was a wonderful, wonderful, fine man, as well as a civil rights leader. He and my dad were great friends. My dad brought him to Detroit and introduced him to the city of Detroit uh, through the New Bethel Baptist Church. If Martin needed money, he could make one phone call to, to Reverend Franklin, and that money was there. Also, that Reverend Franklin could de deliver his daughter over whatever record executives or managers would say. And I think that was uh, Aretha's uniqueness. Uh, you didn't go through an agent to get Aretha. You went through her daddy. He very definitely had an appreciation for gospel music. One of his favorite songs was Precious Lord, and he would always ask me to sing that for him. And I know you'll reach out and uh, take my, you'll take our pain. know how much work she did with Martin Luther King. She devoted an enormous piece of her life to Martin Luther King, which meant giving of herself, yet she herself was not a sloganeer or a polemicist. This was acting out of the purest wellsprings of faith and belief. When you look at the whole time, the whole change that America uh, was going through, and Aretha came through with the new image, uh, uh, Aretha had a new dignity. Every song that she did bespoke her condition at that time. 
because if it didn't, she couldn't sing it. When Aretha was having emotional problems or personal problems, it might be difficult to get her to commit to the studio. And she might even, if let's say if she was living in Detroit, she might even come into New York and find it impossible to leave the hotel and come into the studio. We, when we started working with her, she, uh, of course, Ted was there. And I always felt that he was pretty much jealous of anybody that would get close to her except for him and her immediate family members. I remember uh, when she went through breakups with him, uh, uh, or the final breakup, I remember. She was highly depressed, and we'd, we'd come up to New York for the session, and maybe she wouldn't show for the session. You get there. Call Me is a perfect example, I think, of, uh, of some of the feelings she was having. I think she may have cried in that, in, during the lyric of that song, because she definitely had us crying. I think she sort of stands out for us, for me in particular, as a woman who has not always faced it that easy in order to get to the top, but who has uh, conquered as she, you know, soared to the heights and gave us a feeling that uh, you, she, you can do it too. Uh, you can overcome the obstacles that are out there before. She would never do a song of self-pity, the scorned woman, the hurt woman, come back please, one more chance. A real man is not going to be intimidated by me. Some men can rise to the occasion and others cannot. first heard Otis Redding sing Respect, and I liked it because of the beat, the groove, I liked the lyric, and I liked the melody. My sister Carolyn and I collaborated on it, and we came up with that uh, well-known line, Sock it to me, the Sock it to me line. The respect that Otis Redding had in mind maybe it was uh, in the more abstract meaning of the word, just esteem and regard for the other person's persona, welfare and personality and life. But to Aretha, it meant that respect plus sexual attention of the highest order. What else did Sakatomi mean? Respect when I come home. Also could relate to it from the male female relationship point of view yes. we girls do give a lot <laughs> some trepidation that we brought Aretha Franklin to appear before the flower children, the children of the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and Country Joe McDonald. And there wasn't a great deal of resonance between this, what they were putting down between their sound and Aretha Franklin's.
when we did those few nights at the Fillmore, I never saw a more educated, perceptive, ready audience than those flower children. The Fillmore West was certainly a high point in my career, and it was absolutely one night to remember. The building itself, I guess, held about 5,000 people. That would have been the capacity of the building, but there must have been about 10,000 people in there. And they were screaming, and they were quite an enthusiastic audience. I figured here's a golden opportunity, and I wanted to hear. So I went, and I, and I tried to you know, be very inconspicuous. I tried to sit in the back of the place, but you know, you can't. Rita found out I was there and just came out and got me. And then started telling the people, hey, y'all, I've discovered, I've discovered Ray Charles and this sort of thing, you know. Oh, yes, I did. Ladies and gentlemen, Ray Charles. Then I'm gonna move. It is. Ray came out and we got together to do Spirit in the Dark. It was just too much. Loaded with soul. They did everything. They cheered from, uh, from the tabletops. They were on stage. They were throwing flowers on stage. Um, it was just a night to remember. call it squalling when Aretha reaches for a note to express a feeling um, that is very typically gospel when uh, she does these wonderful runs that no one else does better than she does that's typically gospel and so everything that she does she still carries forth her gospel training Come Another project that I was very pleased with because I spent a lot of years trying to persuade her was to get her into church to do the gospel album Amazing Grace at the Reverend James Cleveland's church in Los Angeles. The sound. As a pop artist, she knows that she's not only representing herself, but she's competing. She is actually out here competing. And uh, I think one of the things that gives her that kind of relaxation in gospel is, is that she's not trying to take anybody's place. Uh, and the people are so hungry to hear her do an interpretation of gospel. I think she make, it makes her more at ease because she is no competition.
I never left the church. The church goes with me. With the Amazing Grace album, Aretha found a secular audience for traditional gospel songs. But by the mid-1970s, soul music, the music Aretha so powerfully embodied, had lost its political and social significance. There was a new generation of fans and musical trends reflecting new values. Aretha's record sales were poor, and her career seemed without direction. I felt that there was still something left to be desired. And so I made the change from Atlantic to Arista, who I felt was a very contemporary company at the time. look for material that Aretha could show that she is contemporary, uh, that she can reach people of all ages, including teens, uh, and that would not be a bastardization of the integrity of her art form. You better think about what you're saying. You better think about the consequences of your actions. Oh, shut up, woman. You better think, think, think about what you're trying to do to me, yeah. Think, 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 think. let your mind go let yourself be free. Aretha's career was rejuvenated at Arista, singing a wide variety of popular music, including duets, dance hits, and rock and roll. Aretha's commercial success established her as a pop icon. However, underlying this revival was a personal tragedy. As children, there was always some caller calling up saying, uh, your father's been killed, or I stabbed your father. So when it came, uh, Mavis Staple, in fact, called me from Chicago, and I laughed at her. I thought it was hilarious. I went, you're nuts, you know? Nothing's wrong with my father. This, this thing has been going on for 100 years. There's always something wrong with it. So she says, well, Carolyn, you know, our families grew up together, and I would call you and tell you something that I wasn't sure of but I still didn't believe her. So she told me to um, call home or call the hospital. And I finally called the hospital and I was just totally devastated because I didn't believe it. shot doing a robbery in his Detroit home. Reverend Franklin lay in a coma for five years. Perhaps she had kind of gotten uh, used to 
him being in a vegetable state before his death, uh, so perhaps she kind of expected it, yet I think it certainly was uh, 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 trauma because she was close. We all were looking at her, you know, saying, oh, she's going to fall apart, we know it, you know, because she'd had her own, you know, problems before then. And uh, we just thought she was going to really go into uh, a fit or, or going, you know, go off, really. I really expected her to go off. But she, um, she really handled it quite well. Many years ago, my dad told me, he said, one day, you will sing for kings and queens. I have, and the kings and queens are here tonight. Oh, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. But this song so very much reminds me of that moment. And I'm gonna do it tonight for my kids. For Teddy, for Eddie, for Clarence, and for Kill. And for you all. On the day I was born, said my father, said he, here's an elegant legacy waiting for thee here's a rhyme for your legs and a song for your heart and I want you to sing it whenever the world During this period of crisis, which culminated in her father's death in 1984, Aretha reestablished the Motor City as her home. While she rarely toured, in part due to her fear of air travel, the record industry came to Detroit to work with her. seem to hit a note straight on. I mean, most singers go for a note, whereas Aretha will bend up to it and then go above it. It doesn't like she never settles anywhere, and it's it's very it's very much like an instrument. You know. An opportunity arises to work with Aretha. You drop everything and do it. You know, and there's no there's not even a hesitation. You know. <laughs> I've always had this theory, uh, if I ever got a chance to work with Rita, I'd try and get her to play the piano, because a lot of people forget that on top of an incredible voice, she's an incredible piano player as well. If it wasn't for the piano, we wouldn't have got the intro, because she comes up with amazing musical uh, ideas, you know. You never have to worry about the tempo, because she just sets it. You know. She's the best. Quite simply, you know, she's the best. Uh, much as I love a lot of other female artists, there's no one touches her really.
she stays tuned in to what's happening today musically. Uh, she stays tuned in with producers of today, musicians of today, styles of today, without leaving her own. And I don't think there's a way in the world that Aretha could ever record anything that you would not know immediately that that's Aretha Franklin. While Aretha has proven herself comfortable in all areas of music, it is the gospel of the Baptist Church that still nourishes her talent and spirit. As her One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism album, which she produced herself, demonstrates, it was in the church she learned the lessons that made her a star and a master of soul, that unique American idiom. She's been categorized as an R&B singer, which I think is totally unjustified and unfair. As Aretha sings the blues, she sings jazz, she sings pop, uh, she obviously sings gospel. Uh, I think if given half a chance, she probably could sing opera if she wanted to. So uh, she just fits in in the world of music, you know, not to categorize her. I'm still got to find out who and what I really am.